Uh, my name is Kendra Bradner, and I'm the project coordinator for the executive session on community corrections at Harvard Kennedy School, uh, which produced some of the lovely papers that you found on your seat this evening. Um, thank you all so much for being here tonight, uh, and a warm welcome to all of those also who are following on live stream. Um, I want to thank our co-sponsors for this event, the Program in Criminal Justice at HKS, Mass Inc., the Criminal Justice Program at Harvard Law School, and the Malcolm Wiener Center for Social Policy at Harvard Kennedy School. Um, I'd also like to send a thank you to those who spread the word about the event um, and all of the staff and students who made this possible. A few logistical notes before I hand it over. There are some refreshments in the back, food in that corner, and some water and sodas in that corner. Please feel free to help yourselves. Um, also, a reminder that this event is being live streamed and recorded. The camera is in the middle, so if you don't wish to have the back of your head on camera, sit at the outskirts. Um, <laughs> and um, if you are tweeting or Facebooking about tonight's event, which I hope you are, I invite you all to use the hashtag Young Adult Justice, which is shown on the screen at the bottom there. Um, we are especially grateful to our fantastic panel members for being here tonight. Um, <clears throat> I want to share regrets from Wendy Still, who had really hoped to be with us tonight, but unfortunately has fallen ill. Um, and so we miss her dearly. We hope that she has a speedy recovery, um, and I know she wanted to be here. Uh, I'll now turn it over to Judge Tan, who we are fortunate to have as our moderator this evening, and she'll introduce the other panel, panel members and take it away. Um, Honorable Gloria Tan is a judge in the Middlesex County Juvenile Court. She is no stranger to HLS, as she has previously served as the Deputy Director of the Criminal Justice Institute here. In that role, she taught and supervised law students representing indigent adults and youth in criminal and, delinqu criminal and delinquency proceedings in Boston. We're very lucky to have her. Thank you so much, Judge Tan. Thank you, Kendra. Um, good evening, everyone. Before I start with the introductions of the panelists, I just want to say that I I'm very excited to be here. It's a pleasure to be part of, uh, to moderate this panel. I had taken great notes, done a lot of research, and then I proceeded to just lock all of my notes and everything in my car just before I came here. I want to apologize. I'm glad that there's a tablecloth here so you won't see my flip-flops that I'm wearing because I also locked my shoes in my car. So... <laughs> With that, having, <laughs> having said that, um, again, um, I am, uh, it's my pleasure to um, moderate a panel of, um, of, of distinguished experts that we have with us tonight. Um, on stage with me are some truly talented um, and innovative leaders um, who have a wealth of experience and knowledge uh, to share with us about how we handle um, just as involved uh, young adults. Um, after I introduce the panelists and have our discussion, I'll then, we'll then open it up to the audience for any um, questions or comments. Um, first, with, uh, to my right, is Vincent Schiraldi. Um, Vinny is a senior research fellow at the Program in Criminal Justice Policy and Management at the Harvard Kennedy School. And he's also the former commissioner of the New York City Probation Department, as well as the former director of the Washington, D.C. Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services. Vinny, along with Bruce Western and Kendra Bradner, authored the paper that um, you all have received today. The paper was developed under the auspices of the uh, Harvard Executive Session on Community Corrections, and it offers valuable information and insights that will help change the way that we deal with this population. Next, we have Molly Baldwin. Molly is the CEO and founder of ROCA, Inc., an organization that many of you may be familiar with. ROCA, um, is committed to helping disengaged and disenfranchised young people move out of violence and poverty, and it serves over 700 participants each year. Uh, our third panelist is Dequame Brown. Dequame is a current youth participant at ROCA and was born and raised in Dorchester. He's currently working full-time at Resilient Coders, a nonprofit which takes on contracts from companies to help build their website while teaching urban youth how to code. Next, we have um, Adam Foss, who is a, an assistant district attorney in the Suffolk County DA's office, currently in the juvenile division, where he leads a diversion program for first-time juvenile offenders. 
He's also co-founder of the Roxbury Choose Choice Program, um, an initiative that seeks to make probation a beneficial relationship with the court, the probation department, and the DA's office. So we're delighted to have all of you here with us tonight. So um, Vinny, I'm going to start with you. Um, you write in your paper that you know, 22 is the new 16. Um, you know, why should we be so concerned about um, the way that young adults are handled by the justice system? You know, we allow people to vote when they turn 18. We allow them to buy alcohol when they turn 21. So why shouldn't we um, allow, why shouldn't we treat 21-year-old you know, or 22-year-olds um, the same way um, they've been arrested or charged with a crime as we do older adults? Right. Well, thank you, Judge Tan. Thank you for doing this and, and the rest of my panelists. I, I appreciate uh, all of everyone's presence here. And uh, Kendra was handing out thank yous earlier, but I want to hand one right back to her. This is Kendra's last week at the uh, Kennedy School. She's leaving us, uh, and she co-authored this paper. She's been the guiding light on the executive session, and I, I asked everybody to give her a sort of round of applause. <laughs> for great work pulling this together. You know, I think, I think in terms of our law, and I'm back to your question, Judge, there's, there's a lot of actually ambivalence about what to do with people between the ages of 16 and 25. Um, so there are, there are many examples of ways in which young people really aren't treated the same as, as adults are, as, as fully mature adults are in, in a lot of uh, ways, even if they're over 18. So, for example, uh, you can't serve in Congress till you're 25. You can stay on your parents' health insurance till you're 26. Uh, it's very difficult to rent a car under age 25, and that's not because Hertz doesn't want my 24-year-old daughter's money. It's because they've crunched the numbers and decided that the pool of people under age 25 are a bad bet uh, for, for renting cars to. Why is that? And, and I think that, that kind of gets, gets to the, the, the question of, of why we maybe should treat young people differently uh, in lots of ways when it comes to criminal law. Um, Looking at the, uh, at the research in neurobiology and developmental psychology, it shows that young people in this age group, that, that our brains mature and we, are, and we become fully mature at much later, later stages than we used to think. So somewhere around the mid-20s, our brains start to f yeah, stop and become fully mature. And young people in this age group are different in a, a number of ways that are very significant to their engaging in criminal behavior. They're uh, less uh, future-oriented, more susceptible to peer pressure, um, more volatile in uh, emotionally charged settings, and greater risk takers. Um, so uh, all of those things impact uh, the, 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 whether they're as culpable as fully mature adults are. And that changes pretty dramatically around age 25. The vast majority of people who ever have a felony uh, record, uh, have start that record before 25, and most of them age out at 25. So you can get people past their mid-20s without having a felony conviction. The chances that they'll ever have a felony conviction drop significantly. And lots of places in Europe have experimented with different approaches to how we deal with young adults, they deal with young adults in the criminal justice system, from giving them shorter sentences to keeping them in a juvenile court, the Netherlands now keeps people under age 23 in their family court uh, to, uh, you know, making them not eligible for mandatory sentences to youth discounts and, and shorter sentences. Lots of different approaches that recognize that young people in this age group are different and less culpable than fully mature adults are. One final point, and then I'll, I'll pass it on to my uh, learned colleagues. Um, the nature of adolescence has changed pretty dramatically since over the last 40 years, but especially since we founded the juvenile court in 1899. When they founded it in 1899, they kind of made 18 up. Right? It was based more on the mores of the time than it was on any science because no science existed. Now that science exists, we've also, 18-year-olds today are not like 18-year-olds were in 1899 or even in the 1960s. So one, one example is in, in 1960, 45% of people in this age group were married. Now it's 9%. And again, marriage, work, finishing your education, these are all things. Moving out of your parents' home and establishing yourself as a head of household 
These are all things that stabilize people and are resiliency factors against future criminality. All of those things happen at much later stages. So we have a group of folks who's more similar developmentally to juveniles than to fully mature adults, and a set of social circumstances where they're achieving full maturity much later and achieving those resiliency factors much later. I think that argues for a different approach to them, maybe not as benevolent fully as the juvenile court, but somewhere between that and treating them like a 40-year-old who commits the same crime. I, I think that's warranted, and as people have experimented with it so far, the outcomes seem pretty good. Great. Thank you. And Somali, you spend a lot of time um, developing programs, working with young people, young adults, um, to try and be responsive to the needs of high-risk young adults. And in fact, your program um, uh, outcomes are, uh, I saw that 65% um, of the young men you work with have reduced recidivism, and 100% have an increase in, in, in employment. Can you talk about um, your programming and what you've learned um, in terms of uh, developing, you know, uh, initiatives to best serve this population? Yes, so I also want to join Vinny in thanking um, Kendra for everything and um, for you all for coming and being with such a great group up here. Thank you and Dequami for joining us. Um, just want to talk first briefly about brain science. I know just enough to be really dangerous. It's my sort of new favorite um, topic and I think we're going to, we're going to shoot up a, a few slides. Um, and the first three are really about risk. I mean, the world is sort of going, oh, the brain really isn't fully developed until we're 25. There's some elasticity. There's opportunity for change in late teens and early 20s. And um, at Roker, we're like, yeah, no kidding. We got that. So now there's some science with that. Um, as, you, as you notice, if, you know, the group age group at greatest risk for driving deaths are 18 and 19-year-olds, 20 and 24 start to change. If you look at other risky behavior like binge drinking, the same thing. It's peaking at around 18, 19, 20. And then if you look at, you know, a, a rate, you know, the age of the highest amount of crime, it's sort of 18, 19, and 20, and 21, and begins to change again, which kind of goes along with what Vinny's saying. It's, um, it's, it's important to understand that what happens is as you're, um, brain is developing and your intellectual part is developing, your psychosocial skills, your emotional skills aren't necessarily catching up until this later period. And you can sort of see on this graph here that there's sort of a gap in maturity. And one great example we were talking about in our discussion was, for example, like here's this race car and intellectually at 20, I kind of know how to drive a car, but I'm not mature enough really to handle that car. And there's a huge gap there. Um, and so that's really important to understand. It's a little like asking someone, sort of saying to me, really, I think you ought to be taller. Well, it can't be. We're, we're expecting somehow and treating young adults to be at a place that they're not. The other thing that's important to understand from this brain development slide, the more blue, the more fully developed the brain, is that it really isn't until you know, the, you know, the mid-20s that, that that part of the brain, the sort of emotional maturity, is fully developed. And what happens is when you're emotionally not ready, when your emotional regulation skills aren't there, when it's not fully developed, your impulse control is, is not good. And so that's, the, that's sort of a key thing to understand. Another um, piece that's important to understand is that there, obviously among young people or adults who get in trouble, there's sort of different rates of getting in trouble, whether you talk about low you know, low risk for repeating offenses or moderate risk or that over time a group of people will desist and change their behavior as they age out. Some young people don't, and Roca's group is really focused on the group that is persistently involved in um, criminal behavior. So it's, I think it's just really helpful to think about the brain development. Another um, perspective is looking at... Um, on you know a group of young people who offend it's as their brain matures their impulse control is getting better they're able to desist from crime except for that other group but putting people in prison exacerbates that so instead of developing the skills in a healthy and normal way um, those skills are getting exacerbated and the impulse control is actually getting less over time so at Roca just uh, briefly um, we have the privilege of working with about 700 young men and women across the state. About 500 of them are young men. 
Um, our whole model is focused on 17 to 24 year olds and supporting young people to get the skills they need, have a place to practice succeeding and failing. Um, I don't know if we, do you have the, sorry Kendra, is there the slide there? Um, it's, it's designed to kind of build long-term relationships with young people, have people practice the skills they need and learn the impulse control that they need through long-term relationships, skills development in every area from life skills, education, employment, emotional regulation, and then um, working with partners. I'm just trying to, I'm sorry. Um, in order to give young people the space and the time to work on their development. And um, so just to, sorry, to go along with the brain development, I think another piece that's really helpful is our framework on the stages of change, which is Prochaska and De Clemente's process about behavior change. And so I sort of like to set the example that when I struggled with diet and weight and smoking and exercise, I didn't really wake up one morning and kind of magically change all those things and just go on and make all these behavior changes. I thought about it. I didn't want to do anything. I started working on one thing. I would fail. I would relapse. I would start again, much like substance abuse. And over time, be able to change my internal desire, my ability to do things. And so Roca's program is really set for young people who start at a point who aren't ready, willing, and able to make changes and to provide a space over time for them to practice and succeed and excel. Um, and just lastly, just a little bit on outcomes. Are we up there yet? Oh, we don't have it. Okay. So um, just an example, just to sort of the so what. Um, in addition, in, in fiscal 15, we worked with 659 young men. We were really privileged to work with them. 84% of them stayed in the program. Young men are not mandated to go. And in our intermediate outcomes group of over 150 young people, 84% of them retained employment for over 180 days, and it could be anywhere from 181 to two years. 93% of them had no new arrests, and 98% had no new incarcerations. So we've been able really to see young people and support young people and have the privilege to work with them over time through that late phase of growth and brain development. All right, thank you. Um, so to Kwame, um, can you tell us, um, as someone who was involved um, as a young person in the um, justice system, what, uh, based on your experience, what do you feel um, worked, what didn't work? I mean, what would you tell lawmakers or people who are involved in the justice system um, in terms of, you know, what do you think was successful and what, what wasn't? Um. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm a little nervous, so excuse me. It's the first time for me. Um, for me personally, a lot of things with the justice system for me didn't work. Um, I know I've, I, I did a lot of, I did probation for a while. That wasn't really a good fit. Uh, they, my probation officer just kept, they, uh, I don't really know how to explain that. <laughs> Um, Sorry, you're doing good. It's just, um, okay. Did you feel that your probation officer was understanding or, you know, responsive no, to? yeah, okay. that's kind of where I was going. Um, at the time, my probation officer wasn't understanding. Um, there were things in my life that I felt needed to be priority. With probation, they, they, they wanted more so what they wanted me to do. And sometimes... I felt that wasn't what I needed to do to make the steps to change in my life. Um, there were also, it's just, they, they don't push you enough. And the, the way they do push you, it's, uh, what's the word I could use? Um, Is it helpful the way No, they it, they, it's threatful, sort of. They'll threaten you with incarceration, and I didn't like that because Incarceration wasn't helping. To be honest, a lot of us go back into the system and learn more than what we already knew. And a lot of the times, the lawmakers and probation officers and judges think that's the best course of action, which it really isn't. Um, up until I got into ROCA, I didn't really know what a support system was. I didn't have that with my friends. I didn't have that with family. I didn't have that with the outside community. 
But with Roka, I had about 20 to 30 different people every day constantly pushing me and telling me that I was something, that I, was, I wasn't one of the statistics that lawmakers and people on TV or political parties make us out to seem. Um, they gave me a belief in myself that I, I'm, I'm worth something and that I come from a strong background that has something to offer and that could be of help in the future. And, uh, yeah. That's great, thank, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, you're welcome. Um, so Adam, uh, I would love to hear your perspective as a local practitioner, and I know you have been a prosecutor both in the adult district courts um, as well as the juvenile courts where you're currently um, practice. Um, what do you think, you know, is there potential here? What are the challenges? And what do you feel as uh, prosecutors' roles should be in, in, in this process? Um, <clears throat> so I, I also want to start and thank everybody for coming. I want to thank Harvard Kennedy School, Kendra, for putting this together. It's a really important topic. Um, quick disclaimer, the following are not the opinions of the Suffolk County District Attorney's <laughs> Office. I am one prosecutor that works there, and uh, everything that I'm saying tonight is, is sort of my opinion on these matters. All right. Um, so there is certainly potential here because I've seen it happen, and, and Dequamie is a great example of that um, sort of dynamic because when I became a prosecutor, I became a prosecutor when I was 27, so my brain maybe had fully developed at that <laughs> point in time. Um, but it, but it, wasn't, it wasn't, you know, more than nine years since I'd been involved in the criminal justice system, uh, involved in crime. And so it was easy for me to not relate to but understand a lot of the frustration that I saw individuals in court having with the way that they were treated by the probation officer, by the judge, um, certainly by the prosecutor, and oftentimes something that we don't talk about is by their defense attorney. And uh, what I noticed right away was on, on Friday uh, mornings, I'd be in the probation surrender session, and uh, there would be a line of young men that looks like me and Kwame just waiting for their probation surrender to be happening, and you'd hear the violations for probation, and it wasn't that they had picked up a new offense. It was that they were smoking weed, out of school, out of work, wasn't, weren't paying child support, uh, was, weren't reporting, didn't have a driver's license, and these young men were then taken into custody and going to jail. Like an assembly line. And I remember thinking to myself, well, how is, how is this fair? How is this appropriate? We're taking young men who, when I was that age, I did all those things, and I was terrible at them, too. And we're telling them, you have to do all these things now because you've been convicted of this crime. We're going to make it more difficult for you to do those things by giving you a criminal record. We're going to pay, make you pay to have us supervise you. We're not going to help you do any of those things. You're going to have to navigate this world that you've had a hard time navigating to begin with. And the next time that I see you, the only time that we, we'll, we will be involved is that discussion when we're talking about you being locked up for failure to do those things that we want, want you to do. And it was just this really frustrating thing. And at the time, I didn't really understand why I was frustrated with it. But what I've sort of learned over seven years of doing this is it's because it's, that's adolescent brain science. You want to get a defiant young person to cooperate with you, the worst thing that you can do is not include them in the conversation, talk about them like they don't exist when they're standing right there, and not asking them what can we do to help you. Telling them what to do is the, the number one way to get a more defiant young person. And so the CHOICE program was constructed um, some, some years ago now with the idea that probation was not supposed to be a place where people feared to go because they were going to get locked up. Probation should be a service that, that's provided because we all want this person to be better. The prosecutor should not be a person who is trying to lock this person up because locking people up, as we know, doesn't work. It doesn't make this, the, the public more safe, and that's my job. My job is to make the public more safe. So why am, I, why am I contributing to the decline in public safety when, as a prosecutor, if I know all this stuff at the front end, I can help design either a probationary program, a diversion program, and, and how I can work with the young person while they're on the street. Um, it's... They're not novel ideas. They're going on around the country. So I really do think that um, not only is there a potential, but there's, there's a movement here, and we all uh, are, should be a part of it. One of the biggest things is, is training everybody um, about these topics. Molly, Molly said, you know, she, she has this 
this baseline of knowledge. We all, we all sort of have this baseline of knowledge, whether it's through the research or just having young people, having experienced young people, um, but we're not implementing it in a smart, forward-thinking way that is deserving of the way that we prosecute people in the 21st century. And Adam, I know you, in your um, Roxbury Choice program, um, which when I was a lawyer, I had clients who went through that as well, um, really got probation involved in a way that I think it hadn't necessarily um, been involved, at least in Roxbury. And so, um, you know, unfortunately, um, Wendy couldn't be here today. She uh, was the former chief of the adult probation department in San Francisco, where they have undertaken some reforms there, which she was going to talk about. And so, um, Vinny, maybe you could uh, discuss some of the reforms that are going on in San Francisco that they have had going on with probation. Sure, happy to do that. Um, just, just to give you a little preface to that, based on my own experience, I'll, then I'll kind of segue into the San Francisco answer. Three jobs ago, I ran the juvenile justice system for Washington, D.C., and to get into the juvenile justice system in Washington, D.C., you have to commit your crime before 18, and then you can stay on the caseload of my former department until you're 21. And then when I moved to New York to run the probation department, the age of family court ended on, on your 16th birthday. So people who were 16 and, and above were all in adult court. So out of my caseload, people who were 16, and sometimes if they were tried as an adult younger than that, they could be 14. On my probation caseload, on my adult probation caseload, processing through adult court, 14-year-olds, 15-year-olds, 16-year-olds, whereas in D.C., we had people 20 who were on my juvenile caseload. And trust me, the juvenile justice system is far from perfect, but they're giving it a shot. They're, they're trying to individualize justice. They're trying to provide programs. They're trying to, to create a court that um, treats young people with some level of dignity and uh, individualization. And they're trying to do essentially what you'd want to try to do if your own kid who was 19 or 20 got in trouble with the, with, with the law. And during the time I was in New York, I was raising, uh, you know, two kids who are now 24 and 22. So they, they were young adults the whole time I was, was in New York. And so if, if you, I think the, the challenge for us all is to the degree we believe this, what the science is telling us and that this is a group of young people that are not yet fully mature, what kind of system would you design for them? And, I, and that's where I want to segue to San Francisco, because I think in San Francisco, they're, 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 they're beginning the steps towards that. So step number one was in 2009, the probation department created separate uh, probation caseloads for young people so that they didn't treat young people the way the Kwame you just described yourself being treated. And I'm not saying any bureaucracy, you're always going to have somebody that does that, but they at least have specialized programming. They train the staff so that they're, they're more like what Adam is describing, people that understand adolescent development and understand what special needs young people in this age group have to, to make those bridges towards fully mature adulthood in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that reduces their likelihood to commit crimes. Um, and they have a special group of programs attached to their young adult caseloads, including education, workforce development, and civic, civic engagement that help meet young people at the stages of development that they're at, like, like Molly was talking about, uh, to try to help them move forward. Since that time, this year in July, the courts and the district attorney's office and the public defenders established a young adult court using many of this, those same principles. And in San Francisco, there's something called the Children's Amendment, which requires that a certain portion of the county's budget every year go to children and up to this year, children were defined as under 18. They just extended that this year by a vote of the people up to age 21. So now they have sort of three elements of, of what you could imagine sort of the beginning of a way to start to create a developmentally appropriate justice system response. They have specialized probation caseloads, they have a special court, and they have special resources that the people have voted should go to these young people to help them make that transition from whatever level of criminality they were engaged in to becoming the kind of people that we want them to become. And I think, I think it's important to sort of wrap your arms around that so that you can think about what kind of government response and what kind of nonprofit response we, we ought to be able to have to help bridge the gap that we, we currently have in our system. And um, what would you say to you know, critics, maybe, um, of um, these recommendations? Um, 
who might say, you know what, uh, adults an adult, they need to sort of face up to adult consequences if they break the law, you know, and, and are we um, <laughs> coddling juveniles and um, is, what about the public safety concerns, you know, what, what would you say to people, you know, maybe prosecutors, maybe not Adam, but, you know, other prosecutors who, who raise those kinds of concerns. Yeah, well, and, and it's interesting, too, because there's a lot of prosecutors that have been favorable to this approach. I mean, the, uh, the dist we're in deep negotiations with the district attorney in Manhattan right now about a full continuum from the first moment of arrest to the last day of reentry for this young adult population. This is a population that is not to be trifled with, right? So we're talking about helping folks and we, as well we should be. But in New York City, half of the violent crime arrests are people between ages 18 and 25. So this is half of New York City's violent crime problem. What we're doing clearly isn't working. And so this is absolutely about public safety, and, and none of us should, should shirk that. We definitely want the best for people when they run astray, but we also want to be safe as we, as we walk through the community. And I think this is a way of doing both of those things. You know, m most of us believe that there should still be a juvenile court, and the juvenile court should have certain tenets. It should individualize, it should try to rehabilitate people, it should make sure that people aren't hobbled for the rest of their lives for stupid stuff they did when they were kids. A lot of that should be applied to 18 to 25 year olds. We shouldn't hang around their necks a sign that displays for them their worst act. Uh, no one in this room wants to be known by the dumbest, meanest thing you did when you were young, neither do these folks. They want to get on the other side of it, and we should provide them an opportunity to do that. It's good for us, and it's good for them. Adam, do you have thoughts? Um, picking up on, on what Vinny said, I, it, to the people who call it soft on crime, because that's what you hear a lot, especially as a prosecutor, you're being soft on crime, you're coddling, you're, you're, you're doing too much. What I, what I say to them is, we've been doing it your way for 300 years, <laughs> and nothing is better. 80% of guys in between 18 and 24 who go to jail are back in in three years. That is a terrible st statistic. So if we think that we're doing anything good for public safety, come out to my neighborhood and you'll see that nothing has changed. And if anything, things have gotten worse. Um, to, uh, to think about sort of what our role in this is and what this cohort really represents, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say, but I, I don't know uh, the, the percentage of, of those young men in the uh, population in Boston. But I can tell you that that uh, keeping some young men out, uh, a lot of young men out, and working with them in the community has been much more successful for me as a prosecutor, even though you're taking a risk in doing that, has, has been much more successful for me as a prosecutor in improving public safety because those people end up with jobs and educations, and they don't go back into the system. Um, just walking around the court, I was in Dorchester Division of the Boston Municipal Court today, and ran into a guy who came through the Choice Program, and he has his CDL driver's license now, and he was actually trying to clear up some tickets so that he could continue working, driving trucks, and he is a different person than when I met him when he was 18 years old. Um, so it's really, it, it's frustrating to hear that people are pushing back on these ideas because we've, the worst thing that can happen is that we remain status quo. Maybe something, and research says, that something better will come out of it, um, but we need to immunize the the public in, in the sentiment that by somehow caring more about people and locking them up less, we are affecting uh, public safety negatively. And I know, um, Adam, we had cases when I was a lawyer in Roxbury, and there would be, um, I know, situations where you and your supervisor would bring the client up and you'd say, hey, can we sit down and talk to talk to your client? You know, first, I think attorney's like, whoa, what are you, what are you doing? What are you talking about? You know, but then um, the, we would be in your office and um, and you, um, you know, and your, or your supervisor would sit down and really ask, have a conversation, you know, with the client and actually ask them, well, what's going on? What do you want to do? What do you, and, you know, and, and I think it was really effective, at least, um, in many cases, about sort of what addressing what Duquami was saying <coughs> about feeling as though someone actually cared, right, and that someone is invested in that person who is on the other side, um, who has a file folder, isn't just about trying to 
uh, lock you up or see how much more, you know, the most number of years that they could get out of you, right? And so I wonder, though, um, is that something that you think, it, and that was, I think, s sort of specific in, in, in my experience to, um, you know, to the people who happened to be there in, in that particular office at that time. I wonder, is that something that you think, you know, should be done more? And if so, how, you know, how do you go about that? Um, abs absolutely, anecdotally, it, it worked tremendously because, again, to Kwame's point, it's coming to the core and, and, and having that feeling of everybody is my enemy through personal experience and, and just watching other people yep. is the worst feeling. It's not going to, it's not going to get you to want to be part of the system. But if you can go to a place where you feel like the prosecutor actually cares, the judge actually cares, the probation officer actually cares, this might be all right for me. So I'm not going to avoid being involved in the system. And there's just a level of unfairness to it because I have a 16 year old kid that's not on cell phone and now he's a convicted felon. I would, encourage you to think about in a half mile of where we are right now, how many kids have stolen thousands of songs off the internet and will never see the inside of a courtroom. And so you layer on that sort of level of unfairness and it's just something that you can't overcome unless you're educated, trained, and acknowledge what the implication of what you're doing every day is going to have. Uh, so, you know, um, raising the age of jurisdiction um, can be a challenging endeavor. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know in our state, Massachusetts, just a couple of years ago, we were successful in raising the age to include 17-year-olds as part of the juvenile court jurisdiction. Um, but recognizing that that can be, that can take time and um, may, um, you know, sort of run into some obstacles, what uh, initiatives or reforms short of uh, raising the age of jurisdiction do you think would be helpful in trying to, you know, have developmentally appropriate responses to young adults. So, and, and Molly's been involved with us in New York City, so before I left New York, we were very in-depth in, in conversation around this population, because it, it is half of our violent crime arrests. And so what, we're, what we did was we analyzed the population right from the beginning to the end. So we re really right up front, you can see it, right at the very first interactions with the police when somebody gets a desk appearance ticket. That's a promise to go to court at some point. I don't think they call them desk appearance tickets in Massachusetts, same thing. Like summonses. Summons, right? So, so for some more serious crimes in New York, there are summonses too for, for the lower level stuff, but for the more serious stuff, they call it a desk appearance ticket. You promise to go to court. Well, when you look at the data on who fails to appear in court, it's disproportionately young people, right? Uh, and the further away your court date is, the more likely you are to fail to appear. It totally makes common sense. Um, then what we were able to do is analyze the people, uh, and then we could see what happens. When you appear in court, there was a less than 1% chance that you'd get locked up. If you failed to appear and were brought in on something else, or even if you voluntarily went the very next day, right? You, you failed to appear on your day, and you showed up the next day on your desk appearance ticket, there was a, uh, you were 30% of those people were locked up. They were sent to jail, right? So it was a 30-fold increase in your likelihood of being locked up if you had failed to appear. Then we looked at the risk of people who got locked up versus those that didn't, and they were pretty much the same risk. They had the same risk of violent reoffending and the same risk of nonviolent reoffending as people who actually showed up on. So showing up was important. We don't want to disrespect the court. That having been said, they really were no riskier than anybody else. And finally, particularly for young people, disproportionately for young people, the short stay they had during incarceration was correlated with worse outcomes. It was correlated with more failures to appear, as you said earlier, right? Because now you feel really, you don't want to be part of this system. And, you know, in your head, even though you got to go, you think of a reason not to go, and more recidivism. So, like a whole bouquet of options show up once you have that information. You could make the time between arrest and court appearance shorter so more people show up. You could call people and remind them they have to go to court. You could. Because most of the time when people go to court, the case gets dismissed anyway. Bring the guy to the desk sergeant on certain offenses and just have the desk sergeant yell at him rather than have the judge yell at him when he goes to court. So he doesn't have to go to court. There's a whole bunch of things you could do that knock a lot of people out from having to have that um, unpleasant, but more importantly, criminogenic experience with the legal system that don't heap disrespect on them. When I, 
most of my offices originally, when I first started, were in courtrooms. They were in courthouses. And I remember just standing there watching these young people just walk through the metal detectors with, you know, take their belts off, get glared at by the guard, go upstairs to court, fall asleep waiting for their name to get called, wake up, the, this, the prosecutor yells at them, the judge says, uh, you know, lectures them, the defense attorney says something incomprehensible to them, and then generally speaking, they go home. And this is like a real moment. You have young people who are disconnected from most of the institutions we want them to be connected to, work, family, school, and now they're connected for a brief shining moment with the government. And what we do with that moment is, is, is push them further and further away from this. And then from that, we get the kinds of experiences that the Kwame talked about and outcomes that Adam talked about, which is far too high recidivism rate. If you were designing this for a kid you cared about, there is no way you would design it this way. Absolutely no way. Mr. Kwame, is there anything you wanted to add? Sorry, what was the question again? Oh, no, I just wanted to ask you, was there anything you wanted to add, sort of hearing about, like, the program maybe that Adam talked about, Choice, um, you know, which takes, I think, a different, puts probation kind of in a different way of thinking than maybe the way your probation officer um, treated you? Um, are there uh, other things that you think of, or, you know, even if you can tell people how you got um, involved with Roca? And what, and what a difference that involvement has made in your life? Um, well... And actually, and what do you think that was different about ROCA, you know, than, than um, your experience in the justice system, in the courts? Well, what was different about ROCA and the justice system is ROCA offered us other outlets. Mm -hmm. um, not only did they offer us other outlets, but they, they offered us classes to help us with skills to obtain jobs to keep a job, to learn how to deal with maybe a, a, a supervisor we don't get along with or a coworker we don't get along with. Um, I can say growing up there weren't a lot of programs like ROCA or the Choice Program. And as I said before, it was just do these things or get locked up. Or get locked up. And I know if a lot, of more, a lot more programs like this were available, and heard of, like, because I didn't hear about any of these programs until I actually looked into them or until they actually reached out to me. Um, so getting it out there to, to the youth and to people in this category is a, a, major, a major thing that needs to be done because a lot of us don't know about it. So we don't know that we can go to these places and get help and possibly change our life around. So, so Kwame, can I ask you something like, how did you find out about Roka? How did, how did that connect happen with you? Well, the connection with me and Roka, I actually, um, I was home on parole for about two years. I was struggling to find a job. Um, and I just, I got to the, the point where I just, I couldn't really do it anymore with trying to find a job and getting turned down because of my record and because of, I had a, uh, a long period of out of a long, long period of time out of work, so they wanted people with a lot of experience and a lot of job experience, which I didn't have because of my time in the court system. Mm -hmm. So I made a bad choice and went back to the, the things I knew that was easiest for me to make income and to survive, and it landed me with another case. And from that case, I. After a year of battling it, I settled for probation, and about a month and a half later, I got a call from Ta, who's actually sitting in the front row, and um, I started making the process, or the steps necessary to get involved in ROCA. And at the time, I really wanted to change my life. I just didn't know how. I didn't know where to turn. And I didn't know who to call on. I didn't have, like I said, there's not many people we can, we have as support systems where in my community. So I didn't, I had no options. I had nothing. And as bad as I wanted to change, I didn't know how to do it. So when Roka came into my life and a lot of things that they offered and I seen how they pushed me and pushed you and pushed other people to just want better for myself. And as I started to want better for myself, I also started to apply the things I was learning.
And as I was applying the things I was learning, I started to really see a, a change in how other people looked at me and how other people treated me. And I just, I kind of just kept it going. And with the help of Roka, I continue to this day to be a better person and stray away from that negative and bad influences and community that I was part of before. So Molly, we just need a whole bunch more Rokas in every community, right? Well, first of all, uh, Dekwami, I think we're better people because of you. Um, so I want to say that. And I'd like to just pick up on what you said. If you don't know how, I certainly can attest for myself, again, that it isn't that these young people are any different from us. There are all kinds of times I get stuck as an adult and I don't know how. And so for a particular group of young people with a particular set of persistent problems, I want to just talk about two how things. One is if you think about yourself for a minute, if you hurt somebody, if you've caused harm, let's assume it's not beating somebody up or shooting anybody, how hard is it to acknowledge that personally and then to try to ask for forgiveness and amends and to live with that? How safe do you have to be, you know, even if it's an argument with your partner or your child, right? So if you've caused more harm, then how much safer do we have to get people so they can really look at that? And so that's a key piece that's sort of missing from the criminal justice system. The other piece is around this brain development issue, and if you really don't know how, what, what we started to use was data and science so that we could understand if we were being helpful or not, what gave us the privilege to meet with young people every single day and encourage them to feel good about themselves and change their lives. And so around the brain development piece, we started to create an atmosphere where people could learn to do things differently. So, for example, the whole education program or life skills program or employment program is based on giving people the skills that they don't have. And if they've blown up at work, not been able to keep a job, they can practice those until they're ready to succeed. For the most part, not everybody, for the most part, the young men we know, it takes them 15 to 18 months to put 60 days in a row of work but they can blow that up and come back and start again. Dequami's an excellent worker, by the way, and a reader and a pretty extraordinary guy. I used to love coming in early in the morning, and there he is with his book. I'm like, oh my gosh, I gotta hang around this guy. But most people at Roca, really, it's 15 to 18 months. And if you think about probation, if they say, okay, you need to get a job, you need to pay restitution, and you gotta go to GED class, but you don't know how to sit still, you're violating probation pretty much before you leave the office. And so what we did was even create educational programs when people have had such bad experiences, they don't know how to sit still. Some people are ready and intellectually ready to take a GED test or a HiSET test, some aren't. So we created education programs, workforce readiness programs that can tolerate you go today, blow up tomorrow, hate us for three months, walk away. I think Duquami's being polite on the pushing you. You know, but we're going out to find you again. You can call us all kinds of names. You can threaten us. You can hate us. You can come back. Because most programming is not designed for that. It's designed for people who are ready, willing, and able, and that's great. But there are a group of people who need more time. And that, act, that repetitive action helps build the brain development, right? The other piece that we've been working on that's really important is we've been working with Mass General's Community Pride Clinic, and we're implementing um, a cognitive behavior therapy, fancy word, um, therapeutic intervention, which is really simple. How do you teach people to think different, to act different? And taken very sophisticated psychological language and made it into 10 skill sessions, starting with what are emotions? If you do not have those skills, how do you get them? And so again, giving people an opportunity to learn to think different, to act different, and help their brain develop. And those are things that help us all mature. The other thing that's really critical that we do is that we have enough time, that we have a program that lasts over time. Not everybody um, is as ready to change as Dequami. Actually, most people aren't. They're mad at us. Dequami can testify to that. Most people are mad at us almost the whole time there. You know, they like us this week, don't like us next week. How come you made me come to work? What do you mean? I don't like you looking at me this way. But then what we really did was try to create a place that, no, we believe in you. If you're alive and you're not in prison, you can change. You can be the brilliant, awesome human being that you want to be in your heart. And it's our job to keep getting better. And then to just to underscore the use of data, we use information every single day to make sure we're being helpful, to try not to do stupid things, because we do, 
and to really make sure that we have the privilege of waking up the next day to help young people make those changes. So as the country begins to look at criminal justice reform, as we begin to look at the issues of young adults, we, we know that the group who's having the hardest time also, more often than not, can make changes. And so those are the things that we use to make that work. So um, before we open up um, to the audience for any comments um, or questions, I want to uh, introduce Ben Foreman, who is the research director at Mass Inc., which is one of the co-sponsors of tonight's panel. They recently released a study uh, that looked at trends in our local courts here in Massachusetts. Um, so I want to just ask Ben to come up and if you want to just talk about um, what your study found. Uh, thank you, Judge Tan, uh, and good evening. For, for those of you who don't know Mass Inc., uh, we're a small nonprofit that works on state policy. In Massachusetts, our mission is to promote the growth and vitality of our state's middle class. And uh, we've recognized and been concerned for a long time that young people from disadvantaged communities who don't get the same start aren't having the level of economic mobility that we would want them to. And a lot of that is social and economic forces that are sort of natural and difficult to change. We certainly don't want a man-made problem, a justice system that sucks people in and spits them out, uh, unable to, to participate in our community, uh, to be another hindrance and obstacle to economic and social mobility in our commonwealth. So we've been part of uh, lots of groups around the country working on justice reinvestment for the last few years. Most of our focus has been on the traditional areas of justice re reinvestment, pre-trial, uh, looking at programming and re-entry and supervision and so forth. Uh, but in the last couple of years, meeting with corrections leaders, I kept hearing over and over again that 18 to 24-year-olds were a discrete population, that we didn't know how to serve them, that they were too hard-headed to take programming, and the best thing to do was just kind of control them, let them out, and maybe when they come back, you can work with them. And um, so that was kind of concerning. And we started learning more and came across this wealth of, of great developmental criminology research that, that acknowledged that 18 to 24 year olds were a unique uh, group, that they were the peak of the age crime pyramid, and that we really ought to have a justice system that responds differently to them. So we've been working on a, a piece of research, which isn't out yet, but I wanted to share tonight kind of um, uh, the main event from it, which is this slide here that shows trends in, in annual commitments across different levels of our, our system. When you look at our under 18s, they've dropped precipitously over the last decade, almost 75% declines in annual commitments uh, at our DYS, Department of Youth Services, our, our, our juvenile system. Then when you look at 18 to 24 year olds, they've dropped at half that rate, uh, but still twice the rate of our over uh, 24 year old population. So it kind of begs the question, what's happening that's, that's leading to these trends? And that's a pretty complicated question to answer. Um, and I can only just theorize a couple of things. One, our, our youth system is kind of one of the most progressive in the country. I think it's one area where we're doing everything as well as we possibly can. Uh, not that we aren't doing some good things in our adult system, but they're certainly more systemic and far-reaching in our youth system. And so maybe that's producing um, so, some of that uh, dramatic decline over the last decade. It could be that some of that is now spilling over into the, eight, uh, the 18 to 24 year olds. If, if we're not uh, harming people in the juvenile system and we're rehabilitating them in a much better way, maybe that's starting to bleed over. Uh, but it could also be that the work of ROCA has really uh, had an impact at a state level. And ROCA has certainly started to scale. Um, we're probably not fully picking that up yet, but maybe some of it. Uh, and, and there's also, I think we should talk about in terms of state policy in Massachusetts, a program that's somewhat similar called the Safe and Successful Youth Initiative that targets proven risk youth. Um, that provides them with case management, counseling, and transitional employment at significant scale. And so maybe that's having an impact there. Um, but I mean, it could be a variety of other things as well. But uh, we're going to have some more in, in a couple of weeks. Um, and I just wanted to share these with you tonight in case they help in, inform the, the, the dialogue. So thank you. Thank you. 
Um, so I just want to thank all of our panelists for a very um, exciting, interesting, and in some ways provocative um, discussion of ideas. And so I want to open it up to the audience. So if anybody has any questions, comments, thoughts, responses, yes, um, do we have a microphone? Um, hi. Um, so I think that pretty much everything that we're talking about, it's, it's kind of obvious that this is what makes sense. But unfortunately, it being obvious doesn't mean that it happens. Um, there's lots of people whose jobs are dependent on the current system. You've got judges and prosecutors and lawmakers that don't want to be on the front page of the newspaper because more lenient policies meant that a young person who might have otherwise been incarcerated committed a new serious crime. How do you overcome these sorts of hurdles and actually achieve these kinds of changes? So my brief answer to that is that we need, we need uh, the appropriate channels to be getting out the message that that risk, that, that what if, which is what keeps a lot of prosecutors sort of in the position that you're talking about, that one, what if of taking a risk on that kid and they go out and they do something really bad is so small as opposed to the not the risk, the conclusion that sending them to jail is going to make them a worse person. So it's really a cost-benefit analysis which uh, really needs to be made more, made more mainstream. The message needs to get out that lenient, lenient policies, which they aren't, they're, they're smart policies, don't create a greater risk of a kid create, committing a, a serious offense. What it's doing is making sure that the 99 other kids aren't out there continuing to reoffend, continuing to get worse, and continuing to commit more serious crimes. Um, so that is the media, academia, uh, and, and frankly the government that we need to immunize the public and each other, uh, the judiciary as well, we need to immunize each other that the, the, the cost to benefit analysis is just so messed up right now. I just want to add something to that. The, um, several states have substantially reduced the number of people they lock up, so it's, it's, it, we can sort of take a look at what they've done in those places and, and use that as a guidepost. So California, New Jersey, and New York have had a 25% reduction in their prison populations, and all of those, during, during the time when they were having those, they, their reductions in crime outpaced the national average. So. It wasn't a jailbreak, and one of the things they didn't, and Ben sort of alluded to this quickly when he was talking, is they, they took some of the savings and reinvested them in the kinds of programs that help people, but also that are pretty popular. When you look at public opinion polling, uh, people are generally willing to, 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 do, to do what Adam said, to sort of reduce incarcerated populations, but they're even more supportive when you start to say, and some of the savings we're going to capture we're going to use them for drug treatment. We're going to use them for ROCA. We're going to use them for, you know, job programs. Uh, then, then, the, then the support for it goes up substantially. So if you can add some of those things together, I think it, it increases the chances that the public will be willing to support it. I don't know this next part, but I'm going to say it anyway, which is that I think for this young adult population, they'd be even more supportive of those kinds of things. We just don't have the polling on it yet because this population hasn't been sufficiently identified. So, uh, just to uh, piggyback on that, Vinny, I second that emotion. Uh, the good news is consistent with what you're saying. There's robust research now, which shows that if we look at these issues uh, in a different uh, frame, a frame in which we talk about being smart on crime, that there are alternative models that better protect public safety and do so at significantly less cost. Uh, an example of this research is Reexamining Juvenile Incarceration, published uh, in April of this year by the Pew Charitable Trust, which documents uh, that many states which are avoiding secure containment unless, or confinement, unless it's really needed, uh, if there's a real public safety imperative, better protects public safety. In many instances, community-based supervision, community-based programming is more cost-effective uh, uh, and, and lowers recidivism. And I think part of this conversation has been moved by the financial crisis in 2008, mm -hmm. which has created a different type of climate. So those of us in this room who talk about positive youth development, that's one perspective, and that's hugely important. Now, the other part of the conversation is that uh, fiscal, fiscal conservatives are now seeing 
that current policy, uh, which has led to mass incarceration, is not better protecting public safety. And as Adam said, you know, that's an important tell uh, of the system. And there's a lot of research, uh, reforming juvenile justice, the developmental perspective documents, what you're talking about, social connection, that's the connective tissue, uh, is what kids need, it's what young people need. And again, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, gonna, it's gonna reduce recidivism uh, in the long run. There was a question in the back. Could I just, I just want to also say on, a, on another practical level that whether it's the court in San Francisco or the Choice Program or ROCA or whoever is working on this, we have to start talking more about risk. I mean, that's what it is. If we're going to make a change, we have to be willing to do that and deal with the consequences. And we need to keep helping each other have the bandwidth to take that risk. Because most people, in fact, can and want to and will change their lives. Bad things are going to happen. So how do we help each other get through those times so that we can continue to do that? Because if we don't, as I think Adam and then Vinny so clearly pointed out, look at the price we're paying now. But, but how you wake up in the morning after something really horrible has happened and carry on is no easy thing. So even in the interim, how we do that, I think, is really critical. There was a question in the back. Yes, hello. Uh, good evening. Uh, I guess my concern with this framework is that um, we're talking about young adults, and we're talking about brain science, maturity, um, and that young, this cohort commits a greater percentage of felonies, but it's not equally distributed across the cohort at all. So I went to the college here. I was dismayed by how immature many of my peers and I was, but the mistakes that we made, there were no consequences. It had absolutely no impact on our life chances. So to me, like the, the, the immaturity of young adults doesn't seem to always be an, a dehabilitating factor. It's very contingent upon what you are, I mean, where you are within the political economy, your, your socioeconomic status, and other problems you're facing. So I guess, um, how does this analysis help a broader policy context where these other problems are still going to persist, is this kind of a, a, a band-aid on a, a certain point of the problem that doesn't that misses the kind of forest for the for the trees, so to speak, um, that's really rooted in the deep inequality in our society more so than the immaturity of a certain cohort of people. I just, I'll just touch on this, because one thing that, one word we actually haven't talked about through this entire thing is trauma, and a lot of this is informed by trauma, and that trauma is, is not, you know, I got into a car accident, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out and commit crime. It's, I was born into a neighborhood that I hear gunshots every night, and I hear siren, sirens on my lullaby, and three or four of my friends are killed by the time I've reached high school. All of those things, whether we like it or not, happen in certain communities, and people who are experiencing those things look, look a certain way. And so all of this research and all of the efforts that are being made are not being made in this vacuum where we're just talking about it's your, it's your immaturity, your, your failure to have this positive brain that's making you act this way, and so we're going to tackle that. It is making it developmentally appropriate not only to, to that cohort of people because of the size of their brain, but understanding that that brain has been stunted by a life of trauma, neglect, and abuse, and fear. I, I agree with everything that, that Adam just said. Um, as as the, the sort of mass incarceration has begun to sort of stabilize and even ebb a little, that's disproportionately benefited people of color because people of color were so disproportionately, were and are so disproportionately incarcerated. Uh, doesn't always happen that way. Sometimes uh, populations, incarceration rates go down and people of color uh, are, are disproportionately left out. But so far, the decline in mass incarceration, the little itty-bitty decline in mass incarceration has been uh, disproportionately benefiting the uh, incarceration rate of people of color. I think with a young adult focus, that would even be more so, and that's because uh, young adults are more disproportionately black and Latino than, um, than older adults. So the average sort of over-incarceration rate for black men is about six or seven 
times the rate of white men. But if you look at the 18 and 19 year olds, it's about nine or 10 times the rate of white men. So uh, I think that if we could figure out a way, and, and that cyclical with, with issues of, of, of poverty and, and, and uh, income inequality, right? It's both, it's both an outgrowth of that and contributes to it because these young people get saddled for the rest of their lives with a felony conviction or coming out of jail, like the Kwame said, where it's really difficult to find a job. It's really difficult to re-enter mainstream society without an enormous amount of help, the kind of help that Roca provides. So if we can ameliorate some of that, I think that that'll help. Is that going to solve all the problems of income and race inequality? No, but it eats a poke in the eye. That's a technical term. <laughs> Hi, um, I lobby in Washington and a little bit in Massachusetts on civil rights and civil liberties and what's hot now is sentencing, incarceration and reentry reform. It's actually gonna happen. It's not clear how much of it's gonna happen. It's probably not gonna be my view of perfect, but it's gonna happen. And the two outside pieces of that, sentencing and reentry, are going to really affect what's going to happen in Massachusetts and throughout the country. Nonviolent offenders are, n are going to be not just sentenced, but they're going to be let out, those that are in. Not all of them. There are going to be all sorts of exceptions to that. But it's going to happen. And that's going to create an enormous problem. I was most, when Molly said, the kids that just can't sit still, they're going to come out of the system. Or they're not going to go into the system and they're going to need help. And to my knowledge, Roca and other organizations are going to, are, do not have the capacity to handle this. I don't know what's going to happen. I sometimes think I'm going to cause, I'm, helping that cause more problems than I'm solving. But this is bicameral, bipartisan legislation that's highly probable to happen within the next six months. Um, I just, I want to just sh share a few thoughts. Uh, first of all, I think it's really important not to forget conditions of confinement. We talk about sentencing. If we can keep people out, that's a good thing. I'd like to come back to kind of what you do. And you can talk about reentry forever, but if you're not paying attention to conditions of confinement and how we're treating people, because people are coming out in worse shape, we're, we're further traumatizing people, we're further destroying people. Um, there are lots and lots of people who don't need anything. I mean, one of the, you know, the Arnold Foundation is doing some of, I think, one of the, some of the most brilliant work in the country, and they've actually showed that low and moderate risk offenders, if they do more than two days, not two weeks, not two months, not two years, not two decades, not 20 decades, their rate of offending goes up. So there are, there's a lot of people who we could just do nothing with and they'll be fine and they may in fact be better off. There are a group of people who are gonna need some help and we do need to figure that out, but I just think that's important to sort out. And I just, I, I'm a little bit on the drumbeat always about the conditions of confinement. It is an extremely serious problem in this state and other states, some are doing a little better, but if you treat people like they're not human and you put them away, we have a system that thinks it's okay that you stay in maximum security for 20 years because they're risk adverse. That's not a very good outcome. That's not something I'd be so proud of. We didn't move anybody to, you know, you know, pre-release. Not a good thing. So we have to approach all these things. But I do think some things are going to change, and I think we have to be courageous to work on hard issues. Oh, sorry, go ahead. And Sir, to your, to your point, and, and again, sort of getting back to this point, unless we continue having the conversation, then those things that you're talking about, bad things happening, are, are going to happen because we are, we've been ignoring the problem for too long. Talking about releasing people in, in, in uh, large quantities from prisons is, is theoretically a very good thing, but the question is, what, what do you do when they come home? Um, and there are a lot of people out here who are having this conversation uh, John Legend, superstar recording artist, he's, he's not making music all the time. He's very passionate about this work, and he's, he started a hashtag Free America campaign that is looking at mass incarceration, is looking at reentry, and really, you know, 
sort of pushing the envelope and, and making people start answering these questions instead of ignoring it and just seeing what happens when people get out. Josh, did you have a question? Uh, I, I have a question for Ben. Um, ben, isn't it the case that the entire 72% drop in the juvenile incarcerated population is the result of extraordinary juvenile defense? <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> Ben, I thought, I thought Josh was going to ask if it was as a result of the extraordinary judicial bench, but I guess maybe that's a different question. I would, I would just like to point out that it started really dropping when I, became, when I came to the juvenile unit, so. I thought it was an I got on the bench, no? Yeah. Looks like I have the mic. <laughs> um, we're talk I mean, now we're in a system where if people were incarcerated for a crime they committed before the age of 18. They're getting good representation. They're going to court for the first time, going to see the parole board. Many of them are being paroled, which is a really good thing. So people who committed a crime a year later are a lot of the people that I see in the state system who have been there for 30, 40 years. And they're just there kind of rotting away. And nobody is looking at the way, at least that I've heard so far, the way brain chemistry played a role, they're being the, retried at their parole hearing for the crime they committed when they were you know, 18 or 19 years old. And it just seems like such a waste of a lot of people who are no more going to be violent when they are, when they are paroled, if they could get parole, but they're probably never going to get parole. So I don't know whether the research is going to filter into this kind of thinking and make it more possible for people to get a fair parole hearing, or is that kind of a lost cause? You know, I, mean, I, I think that part of, the, part of what sort of has me excited about this issue is this exact thing, like this stark cliff you drop off when you hit this scientifically irrelevant magic birthday, be it 18, 17, 16, depending on your state, right? You just drop off a cliff and are suddenly eligible for 20, 30, 40 year sentences, when if, if you'd have committed that crime a week before, you'd have been looking at two years maybe in a juvie, or maybe probation and, and some programming, right? It, it's crazy to, to think that, that this developmentally irrelevant date is so profoundly relevant to the amount of time you could spend incarcerated. And I, I mean, it's hard to know, you know, they founded the juvenile court in 1899, and within, within uh, by 1925, 46 states, and remember there were only 48 states then, right? 46 states and 16 European countries had established juvenile courts. And it really caught on like wildfire. And it's difficult to know what could conceivably happen with this issue, but certainly part of it is to try to get at that really harshly punitive, uniquely American way of sentencing people. And, and maybe one day we'll get there for everybody, but I think there's a really good developmental argument to get there now for 18 to 25 year olds. Um, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of discussion around how we're gonna end mass incarceration, how we're gonna cut the prison population in half. I don't know what could happen with, with this group, but you could do a lot worse than start by curbing sentences, shortening them, encouraging uh, jurisdictions, counties to not send them to state prisons through, you know, uh, through realignment schemes and, and justice reinvestment kind of fiscal incentives, uh, giving youth discounts uh, to, to young people, keeping them from getting felony convictions, because lots of times it's, you get really hit when you get that second or third <laughs> felony conviction, you start to get life sentences and 25 year sentences. If, if we could pull together a conglomeration, a package of policies, programs, and practices that effectuated what I just described and what's described in, in more detail in, in the papers that you guys got handed out, I think we can make a huge difference in, in, that, in that number of, of folks in prison just because they wouldn't come into their you know, sort of mid-20s with one or two felony convictions and they wouldn't be eligible for these kind of crazy sentences that no young person should get. And, and that's kind of seeping in right now. I mean, the Supreme Court heard arguments this week about, uh, about abolishing life without the possibility of parole for juveniles. 
18-year-olds are juveniles. They are. In Lawrence Steinberg's new book, he, he, his parameters for, for being an adolescent go up to age 25. They are scientifically juveniles. They are much more similar to juveniles than they are to fully mature adults. And one day, the law is going to catch up with that science, and, and it's our job to sort of make that happen. And how that ends up happening, I don't think any of us can tell right now, but I, I, I think we, we, that genie is not going to go back in a bottle. Too many people, as Ben said, are just realizing this on their own, and the science is backing up what most of us know instinctively. So the, there's a question there. Ooh, sorry. And then the lady in red. Uh, hi, Molly. Um, Earlier when you, you and Dequame were talking about his experience with Roca, you mentioned, uh, I think I heard you right, when you said that uh, repetition, consistent support helps build brain development. Um, and I guess I'm wondering, if I did hear you right, whether the research uh, allows for any way to quantify that such that we could make it more repeatable and scalable. Um, well, I'm, I'm sort of taking a guess on this. Um, there. There are some things where you kind of repeat things and it builds brain development. It also helps on trauma recovery. Um, I think if you really had to do it, you'd have to do brain scans. I don't think we're quite there yet. Um, certainly, um, things in cognitive behavior therapy have shown some things. Certainly, some repetition of things. If you think about, if you're lucky enough to come from a home where you're getting a lot of support, there's a lot of safety, there's a strong network, people are repeating things. You're repeating things to your children. So if you didn't have the opportunity to repeat, to learn, to practice, to succeed, um, we, there, there, oh, oh, I'm really way over my head, but let me try this. As I understand part of the brain development in a very simple version, trauma and some things get stuck in the limbic system. They're sort of stuck in the back of the brain. And um, when you kind of can repeat things and practice them, it actually moves them to the front of the brain, the prefrontal cortex. And so that's part of why the repetition um, is, is so important and that the act of actually doing those things is important. This, I'm, I'm, this is such a simple version, of, it's almost embarrassing. Um, but that's my simple version of understanding this. I mean, I, but I think it's really worth looking at and understanding. And I, we do know that CBT has been extremely effective in substance abuse work and in um, helping people reduce criminal behavior over time. And I apologize if I've offended any scientists in the room with my way too simple grasp of this. Hi. Um, I wanted to first thank you for raising awareness that, about this age group um, because it is so important. I work for, um, I'm a volunteer for a restorative justice program, and we see um, people, young adults, all the time. Um, getting into trouble, and, and our role, um, our program started by people that worked in the Concord prison who wanted to try and circumvent people getting into the justice system in the first place. And so we, um, if the offenders are willing, we have them come into a community-based restorative justice system pre-charge with the police. Um, and um, it's been extremely effective. And um, we're also looking into, you know, working in schools, and I know there's a lot of restorative justice programs and other programs that are trying to address youth needs and young adult needs before they, you know, end up incarcerated and with a record. So um, can you speak to some of those things that are going on that we should try and encourage? Beside, I mean, Roca's doing an excellent job, and there are similar programs to Roca, but I'd love to hear what else is out there. I think the world is emerging on this. I think it's there. First of all, every time I come to one of these forums, I learn more about what's going on in different places. Um, and I think that there's room for sort of different touches at different stages of the system. So uh, Roca is clearly for people who are at very high risk. Um, and as Molly said, you don't want to over-program people who aren't at high risk. On the other hand, you don't want to do nothing for them either because um, voluntary programs and less um, less rigorous programs can also help guide people and move them towards the kinds of um, bridges to full maturity, employment, uh, education, civic engagement that they're going to need to cross before they become fully mature adults. So I, you know, I don't have an encyclopedia on this, 
But what I'm hoping to do, um, and I want to mention two things now before I forget. One is we're going to be holding a class on this subject uh, in the spring and a reading group on it uh, right now, starting in November. And there's information, I think, somewhere in the room. Is it back there, Brian? It will be. Okay. It's coming. Uh, so if people want to sign up for that. Um, but we're hoping also at the Kennedy School to pull together a website on the kinds of programs and kinds of policies and practices affecting young adults around the country and, and, and in, in foreign countries as well, and to serve as a sort of um, uh, trading house for that kind of information so that people can, can deposit and withdraw. There's, there's been a really nice sort of dovetail with all of this brain science with the restorative justice community because prior to maybe the brain science being adopted, restorative justice was sort of looked at the same way. It's liberal, agenda, partisan, whatever you want to call it. Um, the reason why restorative justice is catching on sort of in this movement is because it's developmentally appropriate for young people. What I was saying before about the worst thing that you can do to a defiant young person is to keep them out of the equation, to talk about them like they're not there, and to tell them what to do, is to invite them into the circle for them to explain their behavior. Why were you acting that way? Well, how, here's how that made me feel. You have to understand both sides of the equation you include them in the, in the conversation about what they're going to do. You give them a choice about how they're going to repair their harm. You don't tell them. You, you make it a collaborative effort. It's developmentally appropriate resolution of, of most of the cases that we have. And, and I'll, I'll go out on a limb and say that victims will prefer that process over me coming to your house, putting a subpoena in your hand, telling you to come to the grand jury, and if you don't, I'm going to arrest you putting you up on a, on a stand in front of your accuser and making you snitch, and then, you know, you're, you're gone and this guy's going to jail. Oh, I think we have time for one more question. Oh, sorry. Um, just really quick. So I agree that reform should be taken. Um, I'm just wondering if there should be, like, with all these programs, should there be a limit with the type of crime that was committed by the adolescents? So... For example, you know, rape and murder, of course, is more severe than um, being in possession of drugs. You could just imagine a, a whole continuum of touches at the different stages. So if you're at the light stage where somebody's getting a desk appearance ticket or a summons, then you could have some voluntary programs to steer people to. On and on through the system where you have people at risk, uh, that high risk, but still you don't believe they, they need to get locked up and then you got a ROCA for them. And at some point there's going to be an irreducible minimum and people are going to have to go to a jail or prison. And in some countries and in some states around America, they have special prisons for young adults. So in many of the European countries, young people in this age group, 18 to 21, 18 to 25, depends on the country, don't go to the same prisons. And in those prisons, they're doing everything they can to make sure that when the person returns to the community, they returned a better person than when they went in. Uh, in March, I visited a prison in Germany. There's a nice write-up on this prison in the Marshall Pro on the Marshall Project's website because subsequently a whole contingent of folks went. But I went with the Commissioner of Probation and the Commissioner of Child Welfare from New York City, and we toured this prison in Germany. It was for kids up to age 25, and they were in for very nasty, violent crimes because that's what it takes to get to prison in Germany. You don't just get locked up for minor stuff. So they were in for some pretty serious stuff. It was one of the most um, rehabilitative and natural settings I've ever been in. And young people were engaged in all sorts of vocational programming, all sorts of educational programming, lots of, of, of therapy and, and, and psychological counseling. The doors didn't lock to most of the rooms. They were individual rooms. Kids and staff were wearing their own clothes. Um, it was, it was a very, there was no isolation cells. They don't even have punitive segregation. So is that going to be perfect when kids come out of that? No. And they had good reentry programming for them. So, but they were giving it the kind of shot that we owe ourselves, never mind them for a second, ourselves, so that we don't get victimized again by somebody who's gone into a, a nightmarish Dickensian prison and come out uh, a worse person than when they went in the first place. So some people have to go to prison, but we should still not give up on them. And again, touching on Molly's point, it's, it's, it's about risk. And I'm, I'm not going to 
talk about sexual offenses because there's a lot of science behind that that we don't understand. Um, but certainly with the with the the murder population, you go to a, you go into any given state prison here, and the majority of of people that are doing murder sentences right now are 18 to 25 year old men of color, and their their murder was a split second deci decision in an, an awful place. I'm not at all justifying the behavior, and I'm not saying that that person doesn't deserve to be punished. The question becomes, how long do you keep that person locked up yep. for that one act at, at a tremendous cost to us? Really, the victim, what the victim's family gets out of it is vengeance, which any social scientist will tell you is not a healthy healing thing. And, you know, how, how long do we keep somebody in for without giving them an opportunity to show that that stupid, crazy, idiotic thing that, that they did when they were young or even that they were just involved in um, should not define where they spend the rest of their lives. So I just want to thank um, the panelists very much for a really fantastic discussion and also to Kendra for organizing us all. And um, I think maybe the panelists can stick around for a couple of minutes if people want to come down and have their questions. Kendra. And also, I think there's written materials. There's uh, copies of the paper available for uh, those of you who did not um, get a copy. So thank you all very much.